So today we have the pleasure of uh, having a speaker, Kuldeep Mil from the National University of Singapore. And Kuldeep has done a lot of wonderful work at the intersection of symbolic reasoning and artificial intelligence, for instance, but really all kinds of different topics. And today he's going to tell us about how to estimate the size of unions of sets in the streaming model. So please, Kuldeep, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Yakov, for having me again. Uh, it's been a pleasure every time coming back to the seminar virtually or physically. So I'm going to discuss our work uh, that appeared at Ports Conference this year. This is joint work with Anvi Vinod Chandran from University of Nebraska and Saurav Chakrabarti from ISI Kolkata. Let me jump right into the problem here. So what we are going to look at is a very si simple and uh, fundamental problem. We have a stream of sets, S1 to SN. All of the sets are contained in, uh, let's say, the universe is omega. There are two parameters, epsilon and delta. The goal is to estimate the cardinality of the union of these sets. And we would like these estimates to be epsilon delta estimate. In particular, an estimate should be within one plus minus epsilon factor of the correct um, cardinality with confidence at least one minus delta. A special case of this problem is of distinct elements uh, where each of the sets are singleton. Uh, this has attracted a lot of work uh, over past two decades. Just before the talk, I happened to look at the number of citations, uh, which are over 500, to the seminal paper by Barrios of et al. in 2001. So, natural question at this point is that, well, how do these sets come in? We are going to look at the representation where each of the sets are represented in O of log omega bits. And in particular, when the set arrives, we look at the family of the sets that allow us to compute the size of the SI. It allows us to sample uniformly at random from SI. And for an element X, it allows us to check if X belongs to SI. The restriction on the sets that we would like all these operations to be done in log omega time and space. And we called all of these sets as Delphic sets because uh, these operations somehow allow the sets to fully express themselves. The setting is fairly general. Uh, there has been a lot of work in the past that have looked at uh, sets of these properties. I'm going to discuss some different families of the sets that we looked at and how we arrived at the problem. Um, just to recap, we are going to look at the streaming settings. So every time a set arrives, it is going to be stored in the temporary memory. The set will be accessed with this set of operations and then the set disappears and the next set arrives. And in particular, in case of streaming, we often look at the space complexity and the update time complexity. Space complexity is how much space we have to store for the storage, and the update time is the time taken to process each of the sets. So now go, let me go back to uh, the notion of Delphic sets. And one question uh, can be, well, where are these Delphic sets? So I'm going to discuss three applications. Um, three key um, areas where these Delphic sets arrive very naturally. The first is in the context of DNF formulas. Second um, problem will be called Cleese measure problem. And the third comes from software engineering. So let me uh, look at Delphic um, in the context of DNF formulas. So in the context of DNF formulas, let's say the set of variables is y1 to yn. A literal is a variable or its negation. The entire universe is this power set of two to the y. So every DNF term is a conjunction of the literals. So for every 
says so dnf term the corresponding set si is the set of solutions of uh, the term ti so as you can see that every set can be implicitly represented by just using the at most n bits which is log omega question to ask is that well does it satisfy the properties in particular, can we know the size of each of the SIs? Turns out, yes. Uh, to know size of each of SI, all we have to know is how many terms, how many literals are in a term. So within time linear, we can figure out the size of SI. We can uni sample uniformly at random. And we can also check given X belonging to omega if X is an SI. Again, all of all the three operations can be done in O of log omega time and space. Kulip, is the assumption that every term is over all the variables? Um, no. That, um, so, I mean, if, if I have y1 to yn, what does this, your example ti, what set is that? Um, that's a, a singleton set, right? It, has, it is representing exactly one um, solution. Okay, so namely, what the uh, if it is if it is y one and y two and y three and y n, then the um, okay by solution I mean all the assignments to these variables that satisfy the term. So there's exactly one term that satisfies a DNF term of size n, right? Which is that y one should be one, y two should be one, y three should be one, and so on. Yeah, that's why I'm asking whether each term will be over all the variables, but you said no. Um, not necessary. Okay. Each term uh, can be um, over just say, I mean, the problem uh, does, um, the, the, the setting where each term is over all the variables is the singleton setting, which has been studied uh, quite a bit, but we are going to look at the general case where each term is over a subset of the uh, literals okay so in this case uh, n could have been let's say 10 and this is one of the uh, ti which is only over three variables is that clear uh, i guess i'm still trying to see what the correspond like if okay set n to 10 what is yeah. what is your set si corresponding to this concrete term um this corresponds let me just quickly write it so that we have. So. i think there's something simple that i'm just not parsing sorry about that yeah. uh, no i think let me just make sure we are so if this is the ti then set si is essentially um over all the variables. So y1 has to be zero, y2 has to be one, y3 equals to one, and then- And what y4. about from y4 to y10? Are, can take all the values, right? So there are essentially the size of SI here is two to the power n minus three, which in this case is two to the power seven. Okay. So the set is like all three variables. Yeah. That are not pinned down by the term. But yeah. so so for him, but but then like T if I had a TI that had, had Y1, Y2, and Y3 all unnegated would represent the same set SI. Uh, no, uh, the set is all the free variables, but um, I guess maybe let me see if I can. Every set SI represents the set of solutions of TI over omega. Um, oh, so in this case, yeah. oh, you're saying okay. So, the, so SI is going to represent a, a, a bunch of different sets. So every particular solution to um, yes, okay. So it's the set yeah. of all satisfying assignments. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Got it. I guess. Solutions. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thanks.
Okay, so let me uh, discuss another problem, uh, which can again be represented as Delphic sets. In this case, uh, often um, the classical problem is called Cleese measure problem, where you are interested in estimating the union of um, union of uh, volume of uh, axis parallel rectangles in a d-dimension space. We'll be focusing on the discrete version. So we are going to be interested in counting the number of integer points covered by axis parallel rectangles. In this case, omega, the universe, let's say each of the dimensions are bounded by delta and they are d dimensions. So the omega is a delta to the power d. And each of the SI now are these rectangles. So if I had to represent a D dimension rectangle, which are axis uh, parallel rectangles. So all I, I can do is um, for each of the um, axis, I can uh, represent a, a, a two endpoints, AI and BI. So um, by this, I'll be able to represent each of the sets SI uh, corresponding, which correspond to these rectangles. So in one dimension, just to make sure we are same phase, one dimension, these are just the intervals. So you are just really looking at AIBI in two dimension, you of course get you'll be looking at. So again, um, if I'm given all these rectangles, then uh, one question to ask is, do they satisfy the properties of them being Delphic? Turns out yes, because you can determine the size of each of these SIs. The size of each of these SIs is really just the product of BI1 minus AI1 times similar values for each of these cases. We can sample uniformly at random by sampling from each of the coordinates. Given an element in the universe, we can check if X belongs to SI just by doing the check coordinate wise. So again, all of these operations can be done in D log uh, delta, which is really the log omega, okay? This problem has uh, attracted quite a bit of an uh, attraction um, in the streaming community. And most recent work was due to Tichpura Wood Woodruff, who was looking at the uh, problem of estimating um, the number of integer points in the discrete. And the um, question that has been looked at is, again, can we design an algorithm that has space and update time complexity, which is polynomial in log omega? Okay, so that was one of the open problems that motivated us to work on it. Are there any questions about it? Okay. As I mentioned that the entire talk is going to be fairly simple and we'll... <clears throat> so, these are the two uh, problems that I meant, uh, talked about in our work. We also discuss another problem that arises mainly in the context of software verification, which is to estimate the coverage of test sets. Um, I'll be happy to discuss that um, later. So given all of this, uh, let me uh, try to uh, di discuss the prior work that has happened. Uh, it would not be possible for me to discuss all the prior work in the streaming literature. So I just want to give some high level ideas. There has been a lot of work in the case where each of the SI is singleton. And there's a long line of work that goes all the way back to 1985 uh, by the seminal paper of Flauze and uh, Martin. And then um, the problem got a lot of attention after uh, the paper by Alon Mathias and Skedi in uh, 1996 and so on. 
all of those techniques that have been developed rely strongly on in deep, limited independence hash functions. And it is not known if these techniques can be lifted to handle Delphic sets in generally. In particular, previous attempts have yielded time complexity, which is of omega. If I can summarize the key bottleneck that seems to be is um, to lift these techniques in the context, um, to lift the hashing based techniques is you have to often do an empty emptiness check here, which is that does there exist an X such that H of X equals to zero and X belongs to SI. And for um, general SI, in fact, the SI belonging to Delphic sets, it is not known how one can do such a check in uh, complexity less than of omega. Of course, given that the problem's name is so general, there is a lot of work also in the non-streaming uh, setting. And um, it goes back to Karp Luby, who looked at uh, these sets with exactly the same three properties. They did not call them Delphic. We called it because it looked like cool. But, um, and um, Karp Luby's uh, seminal paper designed the first uh, FP RAS for uh, this, uh, Delphic, uh, this uh, Delphic sets, in, particularly in the context of DNF formulas. And that was followed up by a uh, long line of work, um, in particular by Kaplubi and Madras and Degum, Kaplubi and Ross and so on. For all that line of work that um, tries to rely on the Monte Carlo techniques, the space complexity is often linear in the size of uh, the stream. Although all of these techniques are often in the context of uh, assuming access to the, all the sets at one time. So for them, having a space complexity linear in M was fairly acceptable. Okay. Okay, so. What are we going to see in the next 30 minutes? Well, I'm going to tell you a very simple algorithm that takes in input a stream of Delphic sets, parameters epsilon and delta, and provides an epsilon delta estimate. And in particular, the space and time complexity both are polynomial in log omega and log n. Okay, so going back to what we were looking for, we wanted an algorithm that can have the space and time complexity as small as possible. And we are going to show how one can do uh, them being in log M and log omega, okay? Before I discuss our result, I want to um, discuss some of the implications of our result. In so we could have just a, a question like is is it obvious that what that you have any lower bounds that like how close would you be to what this is even doable uh okay yeah that's a very good point um no we don't have unconditional lower bounds um yeah um when each of the sets si are singleton then in that case, uh, it's known that you can do with uh, log omega plus one by epsilon squared. In fact, this was also uh, improved recently. Um, yeah, so, and um, one of the thing that you can do is that um, if you allow want to have the time complexity that is uh, of omega, uh, then for each of the set, you can enumerate the entire set and process them one by one. So there's no unconditional lower bound for this problem. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. And we do show that, um, of course, perhaps I can just quickly point out the operation here can be done in NP for all these sets. So if you allow P 
equals to NP then also uh, the same lower bound applies. Uh, in fact, the upper bound, you can also obtain the upper bound under P equals to NP. Okay. Right, so why should you uh, care about uh, the result? Well, here are some of the implications beside it being very simple. Um, it gives the first efficient algorithm with linear dependence on the dimension D in case of Cleese major problem. It matches the best known bounds in streaming setting for DNF formulas. And in the context of coverage estimation, which is actually the problem how we started working on it, we have gone on gone ahead and implemented the algorithm and it does outperform all the currently used techniques in practice. So now let's go back to the theorem that I would like, we would like to be able to prove here. So let's see, we would like to design an algorithm that stores the num at the storage complex, uh, space complexity, something like log M, and also the time complexity, again, polynomial in log M. So what can one do? Well, we are certainly going to rely on some of the simple concentration bounds. In particular, we are going to rely on Chernoff bounds and another ingredient that we are going to use the coupon collectors. So let me just quickly go over them just to get ourselves um, them out of our way. So the Chernoff bound, I hope all of uh, everybody would agree with me that given a set X, if we want to set, sample every element of X with probability P, and if G is the number of elements chosen, then the you can do a concentration bound to say that um, C should not be uh, not bad. It should not be too far from P times X. And in particular, the other um, the, uh, other um, ingredient that we are going to use which is the coupon collector problem. So in this case, given a set X, if we want to uh, draw K distinct elements with probability at least one minus Delta, then how many samples should we draw? And the answer turns out to be K log K by Delta. So that's it. These are the two um, simple things that we are going to use, which are often taught at uh, undergraduate level. So let's see, with these, how do we go about uh, <clears throat> making the algorithm work? Well, really kind of the core idea is we would like to be able to sample from the union of all the sets with independently with probability P, right? So you can see how things are going to work out. If one can do such a sampling, then we know that the number of elements that we are going to choose will give a good estimate of the union. But the question is, how can we sample every element of the union independently with probability P as they come in a stream? Okay. So how do we go about achieving sampling every element in the union uh, with probability P. Let's say for now, let's say we know the probability in advance. So how would we go about doing so? So here's the algorithm that I have listed here in seven lines. So what one can do, let's say B is the bucket that we want to maintain. So every time the set SI comes in, we do two things. One, we go over all the elements in the bucket that we have, and we check if any element in the bucket that also lies in SI, then we remove that element from the bucket. And now we pick each of the, every element of SI with probability P and we add them to the bucket. 
Okay. Could they, yeah. Sorry, how uh, this pick each element of SI with probability P, how do you do this in, in the setting uh, that you're in? Like you can pick one element at random? Yeah. So I guess I was going to cover that at, um, in another 10 minutes. So for now, okay, perhaps. Uh, I mean, it's only a two line answer. So I, okay. I'm just going to be there. Okay. So right now, let us assume that we are able to do this operation. Okay. So why does this work? Well, the reason this works is kind of fairly straightforward is we can represent the union until SI as a disjoint union of SI and the union until I minus one minus SI. So whenever we remove S belong to SI from the bucket, it ensures that suppose at some point you have picked all the items until I minus one with probability P. So by removing, we ensure that all the items from this set are picked with probability P. And by adding every element of SI with probability P, we ensure that all the items in the union are picked with probability P. Okay. So really, the idea is that you can look at the union as disjoint union of two sets. For the first set, we can well, we have SI right now, so we can pick every element of SI with probability P. And in case of the second set, we have picked every element with probability P, we can remove all the elements that lie in SI. Okay, so if you agree with me that on this, then the algorithm is going to be fairly, almost follow from here. So suppose for now, let us assume that we know some good lower bound on the union. Then what we can do is that we can pick, now we have to decide how, what probability to have. So it turns out that having a probability that is one, one over L, and also this additional factors of log one by delta and one over epsilon square. So that's going to be our P. And in that case, we can, for each of the set that comes in, we can repeat the process here from line two to um, eight. And at the end, as we, as we saw that we can just apply simply the turn off bound because B over P represents a good estimate. And in the turn off bound analysis, if I can just go, as long as P is something which is one over uh, X, uh, the cardinality of the set X, then it suffices. So as long as we have a good lower bound here, this would work out. So if we know a very good lower bound, a very tight lower bound, then the algorithm that I just discussed here would suffice. Of course, we don't have a good tight lower bound. So what are we going to do? Well, we will have to change P as we go along. So the issue is that we don't have a good lower bound. So how do we circumvent the issue? It's kind of a trick that we often use. We start with P equals to one. And now the other issue that we would like to ensure is that the size of the bucket, we don't want it to grow too large, okay? So let's say we would like the size of the bucket to be bounded by some threshold. So I'm going to come back uh, to estimate this value of the threshold later on. So let's say there is some threshold 
and you don't want the size of the bucket to grow larger than that threshold. So here's what you do. Whenever the new set comes in, we do the same operation. If there's an element in the bucket that lies in SI, we remove the element from the bucket. We pick every element of SI with probability P, we add all of them to the bucket. If the size of the bucket is great, goes over threshold, and at that time we update P to P over two, and we throw away every element of B with probability half. And now at the end, we are going to have, we have the bucket here and divide by the probability P. So this would ensure that the bucket at no point has more than threshold many elements, but there are some error terms that are going to go in the, uh, error probability. And now for this algorithm to work correctly, what we need to show is that, well, this B over P is a good estimate. So what can go wrong? Since we are continuously decreasing the probability, every time the size of the bucket crosses our threshold, we decrease the probability. So what can go wrong is that it, the probability value P can become very small. So we would like to ensure that P does not become very small, okay? Now we are going to look at, look at how can we ensure P does not become very small. As you can see, that there is going to be a relationship between P and the threshold, because if you set threshold to omega, then of course P is always one. If you set threshold to be very small, perhaps one, then P will quickly become small. So let's look at the relationship between P and uh, threshold. So ideally from the churn of bounds, we would like, P to not become smaller than the ideal P that I'm going to denote as P star. So this is really, remember this was L earlier for us. So the best lower bound, the tightest lower bound on union of SI, the ideal lower bound is of course the exact cardinality. So this is our P star. Now we are going to ask, how can we always ensure that P is greater than or equal to P star? Let's do the analysis. Whenever a new set SI arrives, we would like to compare what is the probability P is less than P star. So what would it take for P to become less than P star? It would say that If I pick all the elements in the, in the bucket that I have right now, suppose I have picked all the elements until at this point with probability P star, then I would like to compute B of P star, which I'm denoting as the size of the bucket, where every element is picked with P star, is greater than or equal to threshold. As I promised that this is just going to be the churn off bound here. So here is the, pro whenever the set SI arrives, so this is the probability that tells us um, that P is less than or equal to P star. We want to do a very simple analysis. Then we, what we would like to do is to say that doing a union of all of these events, bounding by the sum of these probabilities, which I'm going to take 
m times the maximum over q i should be less than delta by two. Okay. Well, we can substitute the values. So what we get is if the threshold is something of the form log m by delta, then we can ensure that the equation here holds true. Okay. Well, that tells us that this is our the expression here is exactly the threshold we were looking for. I hope this is clear. So going back, let's see what's the final algorithm. We start with an empty bucket. We initialize P to one. The threshold expression is what we just derived. And now the idea is that whenever S every new set comes in, we look at all the elements in that, we look at the elements in the bucket, we see that if any of them also lie in the set SI, we remove them from the bucket, then we pick each element of SI with probability P, we add them to the bucket. If the size of the bucket grows over threshold, then we update P to P by two, and we throw every element of B with probability half. I'm sort of simplifying a little bit here. As you can see that might have to do a while loop, just in case in the size of the, to ensure that the size of bucket at no point is greater than threshold. Though that's some minor detail. And finally, your estimate is the bucket you have and the current value of P. Let me come to the final missing piece of the algorithm, which is, well, how do we implement pick each element of SI with probability P? Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, we know we can determine the size of each SI. And what we want to do is to pick every element with probability P. So first we are going to look at, um, which is, it's a binomial distribution. So we determine how many elements we are going to pick. And then to pick NI elements, what we have to do is that we have to draw NI distinct elements from SI. And for that, we rely on the coupon collector problem, which is really we have to get NI log NI samples. Okay. That's it. Since in the bucket, you are never going to add more than threshold many elements. And the threshold is just log M by Delta. Each of the elements can be described using log Omega bits. So the space complexity is what we were looking for. The time complexity corresponding to sampling uh, the elements with Ni log Ni and some of these operations comes out to what we were looking for. Um, Kuldeep, are you also simplifying in the sense that it could be that S1 already has many elements and uh, you were adding every element of probability one. So before you start removing things, you might already have a big set. Ah, yes. So I think 
this is yeah so i guess i uh, you are right so one of the important of um implementation detail here is that you can update the value of p um to be the um so instead of adding with probability one so in order to uh, you can combine the operation from line 8 to 11 by directly updating p to be log si oh, okay but can't you or 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 like i mean if you would you have space to just keep the, your current bucket and the last one and as soon as line nine fails you just revert back to your old bucket and do the like do all the winnowing there and then start over from the beginning with the current set or that wouldn't work um uh well i uh, know i think i mean uh, what we do uh, of course this was the uh so in this case you can directly pick the right p so the algorithmic small algorithmic detail is that this entire step can be implemented uh directly by picking the right p so the p that comes out to be is we don't want more than uh threshold many elements so p just turns out to be log si i believe something si over threshold or so Oh, you're meaning at the i-th step, you you just you start by computing how large the set is, and then you check if if you need to yeah. pick your p. So you can pick the right p. So you can combine the line eight to eleven by picking the right p with which you can start. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this is something that you had to also do as you are processing whenever the set comes in. Uh, um, you can decrease the piece so that you don't pick more than threshold many elements um, because you are anyway going to throw them away. So you can simulate the entire thing by not having to pick them explicitly in the first place. Right. Right. Yeah, and that's also ensure that the value of P says that that the value of Ni here is going to be less than threshold. Okay, so if I can recap the main ideas of our algorithm. There were what we wanted to ensure is that ev at every point of the time we would like to store the random subset so that every element is in B with probability P, P is small enough that the number of elements selected is not too large, and with high probability P um, is greater than one over the cardinality of the union. And then B over P can help us to estimate the union. How did we satisfy the above three criteria? Well, based on these three uh, observations, one was uh, viewing the union, the disjoint union of these two sets, and then um, throwing away the element that line SI when you are processing SI. Um, in order to ensure that P is not small enough, we decrease the p whenever the bucket b crosses a threshold we resample and the third thing follows from the simple concentration bond analysis that we did of course this gives a very simple algorithm even for very well studied problem of distinct elements in that case a uh, lot of things about coupon collector and all you don't have to worry about which is what brings me to the future work uh, one of the thing we are looking at is to come up with a very efficient practical implementation in a library that can be reused 
um, in the context of distinct elements where each of the sets are singletons. The algorithm also gives a new FPRAS in the context of DNF counting, which would be very interesting um, because there are some applications where the DNF formula has become very large. That streaming model seems to be a better way to, um, would be a natural fit. And finally, the complexity, as you can see, depends on the size of the stream. Ideally, in the streaming model, one would like to see if the update time and space can be independent of the stream size. So these are three directions that would be worthwhile looking at. Is it at all a concern? Like if you want in both insertions and deletions, I was somehow trying to understand how is it crucial here that we only add stuff and never subtract? Yeah, that that is a one weakness of uh, the algorithm here that um, it's it doesn't. There are no straightforward extensions that can handle the listen. Um, in some sense, the reason is that P is being decreased monotonically. So if you do the listen, then it's not clear how one would handle it. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, You're saying like if some intermediate result is gigantic, then I, I push down your P and then, you know, once you're low enough, then I start erasing stuff and and then you lose. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Uh, this is, of course, an advantage of a lot of these hashing-based techniques which maintain a linear sketch and they can do addition and deletion. Um, but yeah, for those sketching-based techniques, it's not clear how you can handle these arbitrary sets. Okay, so I guess I did manage to hold up to my promise. That uh, finishes the talk. I'll be happy to take more questions, discuss. Uh, I think I try to close over only very few technical details, so I can certainly discuss them at length. But other than that, um, that's it. That's the end of the talk. Thanks everyone for uh, being a wonderful audience this afternoon. Um, I'll be still around. Thank you so much, Kuldeep. This is a very nice talk. I, let, I say let's take a few quick questions and then maybe a chance to grab coffee and then we'll at least uh, you know reconvene in, in 10 minutes and see if, if you want to talk about anything. But certainly we could take a couple of questions now. So, so one thing that I was wondering, what is it? I mean, it's it's very, very, I agree, it's very neat. It's very clean. So what's like the key? Is there, a, you you know, you listed these three criteria. Is there like a key insight? For instance, this this uh, highly somehow counterintuitive step of, of removing everything that you already have and resampling. Is that like, you know, the thing that's the magic that makes it tick? Or is it just a combination of everything or? Uh, yeah, so I guess now I can try to unpack. Um, yeah, so there were, of course, these are called sampling-based um, algorithms and people were looking at it. And uh, really the kind of key insight is, as you mentioned, removing from the bucket. Um, yeah, so the line five, six was the key um, because there were, yeah, earlier, a lot of attempts would try to somehow keep track of if you see the repetitions and from there try to estimate the right probability and so on. So really the kind of the key insight is that if you want to maintain the union, then you can just remove currently from the, um, uh, yeah, in line five, six. And that's what really makes the algorithm work. 
So um, perhaps, yeah, I mean, once you see the solution, it becomes very obvious, but otherwise um, the real issue was if the same elements repeats again and again, then um, what do you do to ensure that it does not get picked with high prob with more probability in compared to other elements that don't repeat again and again. And this idea of removing the element from the bucket, ensure that an element does not get any advantage because it's just repeating again and again. So at, at the end, the probability of S being in the bucket only depends the last time it occurred in the stream. Everything else does not matter because it got picked earlier. Then if it came back again, then it will just first get removed. So that was kind of the insight that made it work. Um, and then the idea that you can decrease the P, you, I think, yeah. Well, once, once, at least for us, that's what took us a long time. Um, and uh, yeah, when, once you kind of see that, then decreasing P become, start looking more natural and then having some threshold so that you don't exceed. So I think everything else kind of flows from there. Any other questions before we grab some coffee? Hi, um, my video doesn't work, so I'm sorry. Um, it was very nice, it is very nice. Um, I I was trying to understand uh, maybe two things. One is if you replace size by uh, the measure with some general probability distrib uh, distribution and you can sample from the conditional distribution uh, in, in the model, in the Delphic model. Um, at least on, on the face of it, it, it makes sense to me. Um, I was wondering if it makes sense to you. Yes, uh, I guess. Um, certainly, I mean, um, there are quite a few problems that would naturally fit that model, yeah. If you are computing kind of the union of, uh, um, measure of the union, yeah. I mean that that is a fairly natural generalization. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, there is a lot of work in case of the you know estimating union of convex sets and so on, uh, where these Monte Carlo techniques have been applied by discretizing those sets. If you are interested in getting an epsilon delta approximation, then you often try to do some discretization. Mm. And for for DNFs, it's, it also makes sense if there is some other measure on the cube other than the uniform for some reason. It's natural. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so perhaps that's something I would like, uh, maybe if I can make a remark, uh, you can, instead of this uniform, you can have some product distribution and you could ask that, I would like to estimate uh, the problem that is often looked in counting community, we call it weighted counting. And uh, this algorithm does generalize to estimating under a product measure. So I showed in case of uniform, but as you can see that you can have a Bernoulli distribution for each of the. Um, so the, the and variables. Is, the, 
but so there is a okay there is a, a the connection to the a coupon collector through this construct uh, the Bernoulli construction for product measure you have a special property that yeah. allows the coupon collector to work yeah and a, a second question that is less in uh, more slightly more technical is why uh, divide by half in line 10 what is special about the number two um, actually, nothing. I mean, some co any kind of constant would uh, suffice. There is um, nothing very special about dividing by half. So whatever constant comes, um, yeah, if one would like, I guess, whatever... this two and these two match so yeah one can do some epsilon or um, yeah with maybe plus beta yeah so, so it doesn't uh, yeah, yes it would be so it will not lead to a significant improvement, but maybe a slight improvement. So yeah, I don't think it, it would make much of a difference here. Thank you. Okay, so thanks again, Kulip. I, I say that, uh, I, again, it seems that we talked about most of you know what we need to talk about you didn't truly you didn't leave too much swept under the rug until the second half but nevertheless let us say that yeah. we take a break now and and maybe we'll still reconvene those of us who wish in a few minutes uh, with a cup of coffee and and see if there are any remaining outstanding issues or or new exciting directions or or whatever so we're back after the break, and and now, uh, yeah, I guess for some final discussions, and it's over to you again, Kuldeep. Yeah, um, I guess I just wanted to mention this kind of a small detail that I took the liberty of not showing earlier, which I had kind of mentioned, uh, talked about that um, we can how to how to choose the p. So it's really, as I mentioned, that you can decide on the correct value of P by looking at this. Yeah. So this is how you can select the right value of P so that the value of Ni never grows goes beyond threshold. And just to make sure that you don't have to ever pick more than threshold many elements from the set. So that was something I took a little bit of liberty earlier to go over it. Um, but I had mentioned that you can choose the right value of P. As I mentioned that you can combine the two steps, right? So that you never have to have um, pick more than threshold many elements. Okay. Well, other than that, I mean, I, I like I, I agree that it's a, it's a very elegant solution. But I guess like keeping the last copy and then just aborting when the new copy, when you're about to go over the threshold in the new copy, you just abort and then you like do the resampling. I mean, that should also work, no? It's just less elegant. Yeah, I think that should also. Maybe it should be fine. I... Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And you, but you wanted to, like, in an ideal world, you did. So now we're somehow assuming we're, we're assuming that we know no capital M, are we? Yes. Um, that is something. Um, in ideal world, we would like to um, make the algorithm independent of knowing the value of M and uh, 
I mean, knowing the value of M is kind of a fairly standard uh, assumption that people often use, but from practical perspective, you would want the algorithm to be independent of M. Uh, at least um, the space complexity and uh, should be independent of it. So um, what is kind of happening here is that we are ensuring that the value of P does not fall below the threshold, right? So, um, uh, sorry, the value of P does not go below the P star at all points and uh, um, this, since P is decreasing monotonically, this is what we would have to ensure. Uh, but uh, it does look like one should be able to get around that challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's something definitely. And how much would you care about the ratios? I mean, it's because it's in, I, I'm still trying to understand if it, is it like quote unquote only the the problem of 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 picking the right p or like that's I mean that's a truly big deal and that's no only at all. In some sense, uh, for the streaming based, you know, all, all the kind of Monte Carlo algorithms, p is I mean, if you have the right p, then you are not going to pick more than the threshold many elements right so it's really a matter of having the right p yeah so i think uh, that's is at least for um um the sampling best techniques yeah that that's the kind of the only thing that seems to matter I got curious. Also, you mentioned that you coded this up and and uh, and uh, tried it out against other methods used in practice. Yeah. So, so maybe you already mentioned it, but like, w where would practitioners actually run this kind of thing? Like, for, for yeah, so what would they do? I, um, I think I can. Yeah. So perhaps I can talk. Uh, how we started looking at this problem was. Um, looking at uh, in the context of uh, test generation. So perhaps I can provide more context and go in more details about uh, the problem that we really cared about. So what happens is um, nowadays, most of the systems have a lot of configurations, in fact, set solvers. And you would want to be able to make sure that at least uh, with all these different configurations, um, the systems would not give a bug. So often the way people try to do the testing is called uh, T-wise coverage testing. So what uh, the simplest way of testing a highly configurable system would be that you would say that, let's say you have K features that you can turn on or off. Let's say all the features are just binary. So you would want to say that, well, there should be one test case where feature one was turned on and there should be some other test case where feature one was turned off. Similarly for feature two and so on. So in this way, you can come up with two test cases, right? One where all the features were turned on and another where all the features were turned off. Um, then you can say, well, that would not be completely sufficient. I would like to have the system be tested for maybe the pairwise combinations, right? Feature one, feature one and feature two you would like to make sure that at least there was a one test case where both were turned on, both were turned off, one, you know, all the four possibilities. So this is called two wise coverage. And in, then in general, you often want to get, you know, a T wise coverage and depending on the value of T you can care about. So the typical setup in the testing of the systems is there is a, you are given a, um, um, you know, set of features, you have some constraints over those because they represent the configuration that are unsafe to try out and which already are known and you don't want to try out those configurations. And a configuration is just evaluation to these features. Then you have some sort of a test generator that takes these constraints and outputs the configuration on which you must try out your system. 
and these are the set of the test um, configuration that come in to you. So uh, this is like a streaming model where you are running the system for a long time. And one measure that you, uh, you are often interested in is that what is the T-wise coverage you have done so far, right? Um, you know, what's the pairwise or three-wise coverage uh, that you have achieved so far. And this is what we wanted to measure. And uh, the current existing techniques, um, we, which was also the case um, for the best known method, you, you, one is not able to do anything better than uh, a complexity that is exponential in T, which would become a, a real issue um, very fast. Um, so what, um this is this is what we were looking at so we we were designing a system that should be able to achieve high coverage and um, we we wanted to be able to measure for large values of t and um, that kind of motivated us to design it and now we we have implemented this algorithm which turns out to be very simple to implement and uh, we are compared with uh, kind of the existing techniques that were all around you know these like exact methods so they were not very nothing since since there were no other method known that could be better than exponential uh, in t uh, so it's very easy to see that the technique that we implemented works much much faster uh, so the existing techniques, in fact, all the evaluations that are often presented would be for small values of T, less than value of T, less than two or three. But now with, in our case, the dependence is linear in T, so you can easily try out large values of T. But there, the, the streaming setting is, is just like, it happens to be part of your technique. I mean, you could look at all of it like offline if you want it yeah. i guess yeah uh, i mean streaming setting is kind of fairly natural there because you don't want to store all the test vectors i mean there's kind of no need for storing all the test vectors but um, yeah for us you could also just um, uh, you know uh, i mean the, the algorithm that i just discussed does not help the store, right? So it just like makes only a single pass through it. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, the complexity of the existing methods, um, both in case of uh, uh, the test coverage and also in case of the cleanse measure, the real issue was the time complexity, which would become of uh, omega. If, if you if you don't want to store things, so this was kind of the real issue that the time complexity would be O of omega. So if I can go back to yeah, uh, okay. you try to use some sort of hash function, then you end up with this O of omega. Okay. So Massimo, I see, is also asking in the chat, did this work originate from a concrete applied setting? Does it actually work for DNF model counting in practice with a smaller starting P, I guess? Yes, so to answer the first question, yes, it completely originated from, a, we had a paper last year in the software engineering conference. This is as applied as work I have done so far. Um, and. Um, yeah, we, we found that we could not evaluate how good our method is. So that's how the work originated. For DNF, we, are, uh, we haven't uh, um, implemented uh, the algorithm in case of DNF, but I really feel that this, this is probably going to be much faster than the existing DNF techniques. Um, we had a series of papers, 2018-19, um, looking at all the different FPRAs. And one of the things you start seeing the difficulty um, with the FPRAs. So I think, I mean, the classical work from Karblubi Madras, uh, where really you, 
you had to store the entire DNF formula and the complexity. Um, I mean, any kind of list storage or so, it starts depending on the size of n. And you can see that this one is just going to make a single pass through the entire formula. So it's never going to store the formula. So yeah, that's something I'm hoping we'll implement soon and be able to show that this works much faster than uh, the existing FPRAS techniques. The hashing based, uh, yeah, just to complete the comment, uh, for the hashing based techniques, uh, for uh, in the context of DNF, you don't have to store the formula, but you have to do this uh, check, which you can show can be done in polynomial time in kind of cubic because um, X belongs to SI, you can substitute the DNF terms and then um, do the Gaussian elimination. But as you say that, I mean, in, in the algorithm that I just discussed, you have to pick as one over epsilon square elements uniformly at random that should beat doing Gauss-Jordan elimination for every single term. So yeah, I'll be very surprised if we are not able to beat uh, the existing techniques for any large reasonable value of M. Okay, thanks. Any final questions or final comments? Uh, I have a question, Kuldeep, which I might have missed, but so you said that it's fairly standard that M, the number of samples is known right yeah there are kind of a lot of uh, so i i guess the what i wanted to remark is between knowing the value of m and having dependence on them you don't want the dependence on m but uh, often in the streaming setting people are fine with knowing m but suppose suppose you don't want to have this assumption. Is there an easy way of generalizing this where you can actually adapt the threshold uh, if, if uh, elements keep coming in the stream? Um, I guess. The problem is that you, it turns out your P is too low then, I guess, right? Or no? Or no, wait. If M grows to if M grows larger than your P is wait, then your P is fine. Yeah, I think I think the doubling trick should work. I did not think about it, but often you can start with you know, assuming some value of M and then you double it. Um, the, yeah, so I guess there would be so what we are ensuring is that at every point when we are taking the union bound uh, we are ensuring that at every point the probability it did not go yeah so let me go there so what we are trying to ensure um, so we want to, we are ensuring that at every point, the probability it does not go below P star is one over M. Um, you can do, um, yeah, if you keep doubling, then it should suffice. I mean, uh, you have to change a little bit, but you can do a geometric progression here, right? So, so you have to keep growing the size of the bucket as you go along to. Mm -hmm. 
So I suspect what would happen is that the final value of threshold will become, there would be another log, log factor that would come in. If you do the doubling trick. So essentially the idea that you start with assuming I am to be, you know, some constant and every time you reach that you double uh, your estimate of M, but then uh, this value of threshold needs to be changed. Because until that point you have made kind of delta over two, delta over four probability error. And now you have only a budget of delta over four for rest of the string. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if a straightforward, that's what I can think of, straightforward adaptation of the algorithm. Very. Your budget keeps on decreasing, right? So initially you, ha you have a budget of delta over four. Once you reach your estimate, the initial estimate, then you want to give the rest of the budget to be like delta over eight and then delta over 16. And uh, yeah. So you get guess an that extra be... log m factor or is that it? Yeah, that's what it looks to me that there should be okay. one extra log m factor. At least, yeah, that's things. Yeah, I think so. It should be just a log, extra log and factor. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you so much again, Kulip, for a, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. And as promised, this was, again, a, it's certainly a, a very, very neat algorithm, um, very slick proof. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, discussing. So yeah, I'll be happy to answer any more questions or emails, certainly.